Welcome to the Indonesianist, uh, a podcast from a new Indonesia project in Canberra, uh, where we have chats uh, with Indonesianists about uh, their interests, their views, and their opinions about Indonesia. My name is Arianto Patundru, and my guest today is Professor Virginia Hooker. We acknowledge the first Australians and pay our respect to elders, past, present, and emerging. And we also acknowledge the support from the Australian National University and also uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, a bit about uh, Professor Virginia Hooker, I call her Mbak Nia. Mbak Nia is a professor emeritus at the ANU Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs. She is known widely as a scholar of Islam in Southeast Asia. Uh, actually, she wrote a, an award-winning book on contemporary Islam in Southeast Asia. She also works on uh, literature and social change in Indonesia and Malaysia and Indonesian political culture. In 2003, she was elected a fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities, a, a very prestigious uh, recognition. Uh, welcome, Bania. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to start uh, by origin stories. So if you can tell us about uh, your upbringing, where, uh, where you were born, uh, where you grew up, uh, then we can go from there. Oh, you're very persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Pacho. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, first of all, to acknowledge that we're in Canberra now um, at the Australian National University, but I actually live um, 100 kilometres away. Um, I live in New South Wales, southeastern New South Wales, near the small town, heritage town of Braidwood. And there, our local Indigenous group is the Yuin people. And I acknowledge them every day because we live on 100 acres of land, which was theirs. And I see signs of them in the trees and on the ground. And so I'm very aware that they are the, the First Nations of where I'm now living. And their language group is Durga. And there's a move in our schools in the district to bring that language back and learn it. Um, but I was born in Sydney. <laughs> And um, I've written a little bit about this because um, yesterday was the 75th anniversary of this university, 75. And next month, I'm 75. Mm -hmm. So the ANU and I share the same birth year. Um, Sydney at that time was just post-war and there was a great housing shortage. So my parents lived with uh, my grandparents and I get quite emotional thinking about this because they were working people, absolutely. Um, they, they did nothing but work at manual jobs, but what they did was totally respected education. So they thought I was a genius. <laughs> so the little girl that was raised with them, close to them, they shared their life with me and the neighbours were older people too. And so I grew up um, until I was four or five with um, adults. And um, it just gave me an interest in people that I've maintained through my life and through my research. Um, so my father um, had served in the Navy, the Royal Australian Navy during the war, and he'd served in the Pacific War. So he had actually been in charge, he was only a young man, but he was put in charge of um, the landing of American troops onto the east coast of Borneo. Mm. So yes, so I had a very early link, I wasn't born then, but a very early link with that part of the world through him. Um, he was decorated for his bravery and his efficiency, but after the war, there was no job. He was unemployed for a year or two. And so he had a young family, me, um, and he decided to go back into the Navy um, and make it his career. Um, 
So when he did that, there was money coming in and um, we were able to move to different parts of Sydney. But he was posted to Korea. And Korea. so he was part of the Australian uh, contribution to the United Nations peacekeeping force that was based in Japan, but it uh, patrolled the waters of Korea. And my father used to post me and by then my little sister postcards of Japan. Mm -hmm. And this was totally amazing foreign um, oriental culture to us. And we thought it was fascinating. Um, and then he started to be moved around all, all parts of Australia. And so I had disrupted schooling um, from one point of view, but from another point of view, it, I suppose, helped me gain some resilience. Um, so through my family connections, um, I did have an awareness of um, Asia. And um, he was finally posted to Canberra. Mm -hmm. And he decided that since I'd had eight different schools, um, he should retire so I could finish my high school here. And that was a very momentous decision because it enabled me and my sister to come to ANU. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so um, at that high school, um, the teachers refused to teach me mathematics because I was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and Eddie Wu, who's very famous on YouTube, would be scandalized that teachers would say a child was hopeless in mathematics. Um, so they advised me to learn three foreign languages instead. And that would enable me to go to university without mathematics. So I did Latin, French, and German. Not Indonesian. So, not Indonesian, because okay, it yet. didn't rate. It didn't okay. rate. It was not offered. Um, so I came to university with a language background right. and thinking that foreign languages were exciting and um, maybe one day I could get to a country where I could actually speak the language. The year I finished school was 1963. Right. And so it was the year Kennedy was assassinated. Um, but it was also the year that Sukarno was on the front pages of our newspapers because of Irian. Oh. So, and also, also his policy towards Malaysia. <laughs> so for the first time in my awareness uh, as a 17 year old, um, Indonesia was top headline news. Right. So I thought um, the ANU, specially uh, advised by the government to teach about Asia, I'm not going to study Japan, I'm going to study Indonesia. Okay. And that's how it started. Right. Yeah, you were ahead of my question because then my next question is actually how did you get interested in Indonesia? So I assume that was your first, like, get interested in Indonesia. Or what, what really fascinated you about Indonesia? I think the fact that it was a country so close to us and we knew so little in 1963-64. But I was not alone in thinking that because when I came to my first Indonesian class on campus, um, there were over 60, 60 people um, sitting in the lecture theatre. So 60 people to learn Indonesian in 1964. And the teacher was Professor Tony Johns, A.H. Johns. Mm -hmm. He was a magnificent teacher of Indonesian. He was only young. It was his, right. it was a very young appointment as right. professor. And the people in my class, in that 1964 class, went on to become the pioneer diplomats in Asia, especially in Indonesia. So there was Jeff Forrester, Chris Manning, mm -hmm. um, uh, Ian Proudfoot, the late Ian Proudfoot, Elizabeth Legg, now Liz Drysdale. Uh, <laughs> um, did I say Jeff Forrester? Yes. yes. So this group, and others went on to be, um, John Monfries went on to be the early appointments um, as experts in Southeast Asia and Indonesia. And they right. came through in that group of 1964. Okay. And I should say that in those days, um, the Faculty of Oriental Studies, it was 
then called, um, taught Chinese and Japanese and Ind Indonesian, um, Korean, but they taught it starting with the classical civilizations. So we started with um, um, <laughs> hominids, early hominids, um, like the skull bones from Java of early, early man. And we worked up through the um, through the megalithic age in Indonesia, um, through the great temples, of course. And so we've got a very thorough grounding in the whole of Southeast Asia. The only problem was that by the end of third year, we had only got to about 1920. So <laughs> we had very, very little knowledge right. of the real world. Right. But then we did our honours year. Right. And six of us did honours, which was the biggest honours year for some time. And um, Ian Proudfoot, the late Ian Proudfoot and I studied Malay manuscripts mm -hmm. and I learned Arabic with Professor Johns and he learned Sanskrit with Professor Basham. Mm -hmm. So um, it was, we had this very strong grounding right. uh, from, from the, the early history up. So how many languages do you speak? Well, in our honours year, as well as um, Indonesian, um, sorry, I had studied modern Javanese and old Javanese wow. <laughs> because we had um, Dr. Suito Santoso mm -hmm. and of course the wonderful late Dr. Supomo, my mentor, Dr. Supomo, um, and they taught us aspects of Javanese. In fact, we had to rote learn the Adi Parwa and other ancient Javanese texts going on to the Baba Tana Jawi, Jawa. And, um, so we did that, Arabic, Indonesian, uh, Malay, including Jawi script. And then the icing on the cake, Ba'aktiat um, Kartami uh, Harja, the late Ba'aktiat, taught us a little Sundanese. And Mrs. Johani Johns taught us a whole year of Basamina. Wow. So it was crazy, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> but your uh, dissertation, uh, doctoral uh, thesis was on Indonesia. Right? My doctoral thesis grew yeah. out of my honours thesis, um, which was um, on indigenous manuscripts from the uh, 17th century kingdom of Johor, okay. which um, the royal family of which moved to the islands of the Rio Linga archipelago, exactly between uh, the Malay Peninsula and Sumatra, right. Indonesia. So by chance, I studied from the very beginning um, an area that was common to both cultures and both nations. So although these days, um, uh, Propensi Riau, Kepulauan, is part of the Republic of Indonesia, it was for a long time very culturally close to uh, Malay, uh, the Malay Peninsula and the Malay Sultanates. And if you'd like me to tell you a bit about your family, yes, your, yes. <laughs> it, it would be a great pleasure to do that. So I didn't do my PhD here. I did it at Monash University. Mm. Um, and Monash had just established its Centre of Southeast Asian Studies. So, um, and Professor Jamie Mackey, the late Jamie Mackey was head of that new centre. And there were exciting appointments there John Legg, the historian, um, the late Herb Thief, um, some anthropologists, ec ec economists, um, and political scientists. And it was a very exciting place. The only thing was, I was not studying modern Indonesia. I was studying 19th century Malay history from indigenous sources. So um, I'll just hold up for the camera. This yes. is um, the text, 400 pages, that I based my uh, doctoral dissertation on. Um, and um, first of all, I had to transcribe it from the Arabic letters into uh, Romanized our alphabet. Um, and there were three different copies of it. So I, was, I had my head in one of the old microfilm readers where it's like an oven, you have to put your head in. So I was constantly reading microfilms because some of the copies came from Leiden, Holland, the Netherlands. 
And I went through all the catalogues of Malay manuscripts and found that there were titles like Sejarah Johor. I thought, what's that? So I ordered these microfilms more and more to read. So I was reading microfilms for more than two years at Monash, um, which turned out to be a really useful thing to do. And then I started working out the content of the text. Now, the Bugis, there were five Bugis brothers who were incredibly full of initiative and um, bravery, and they were mercenaries and they were traders. Um, they cleverly married into the royal families wherever <laughs> they landed. Um, and um, they would hire them, sell themselves to assist um, local Malay rulers who were disputing their thrones. So if there were two brothers fighting over a, a throne, then one of them might hire these amazing boogies <laughs> to fight on their side. So the boogies had chain mail, so baju rande, they called it. Right. And um, they wore that. They also had firearms yeah. and they were incredibly ruthless with their yeah, chris and wacky, their daggers. Wacky, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and all the cutlasses, yeah. machetes, anything. Right. They were very efficient. Yeah. And they would win the wars for these people. And so they would be rewarded with a princess and that would give them access to the royal line. So they then cleverly maneuvered themselves into being advisors. Um, and because of their trading connections throughout the archipelago on the east coast of Sumatra, in Batavia, up the coast of uh, the Malay Peninsula, they um, bought and sold opium, <laughs> made a lot of money from opium and also the tin trade. So they were extremely successful as both traders and fighters and administrators. Now, the author of this text, who was called Raja Ali Haji. Um, Raja Ali Haji of the Gurin, Gurindam Douglas. Exactly. Oh. Yes, that's him. So he wrote this. And um, his father was uh, very well connected. And Raja Ali Haji was actually from a secondary wife. So, but he was obviously very intelligent. And his father trained him in Arabic and Islam. And they were the first ones from this whole area to make the pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina. And they stayed for one year. And Raja Ali Haji studied um, in Mecca with the great um, uh, teachers, Islamic teachers uh, of, of the day. And he must have been really quick to learn because he was only there for about a year. Then he went back with his father to um, Riau, and they stopped off in Penang, where he was given a wife, because having made the Hajj, he was very marriageable, people wanted yeah. to marry, and he went by Kandahar, Afghanistan, wow. incredible, anyway, he made a life in Riau, advising his cousins, who were called the Yang Tuan Muda, Yang Tuan Muda, advising them on administration, on legal matters, on Islam, and on correct behavior. And I'll just pause a little bit longer on him because recently, this has never left me, right? right. I completed this in 1973, but there's been various Malay um, new versions of it that they've asked me to do and two English translations. The first English translation was published 1982 and it would not have been possible without the help of a dear colleague, Barbara Ann Dyer. And she said, you will go mad if you translate that by yourself and it will take years, I will help you. And she was an expert on the Malay world too. So together we translated it and published it together. And it's now recognized as, as a basic text. Mm -hmm. But more recently, the Malays asked me, the Malaysian government asked me to do another translation, which was published in 2012, um, which is a prestige sort of version, which won prizes. And um, I updated the translation for that. So that's available too. Um, so Raja Ali Haji was interested in change 
So we're going back to the 1860s and 1870s now. Singapore was next door to Ria right. and being good Bugis traders, they were doing trade. They'd set up um, shops and so on, trading companies in Singapore. And Raja Ali Haji knew there were printing presses there. He witnessed the first printing presses. He imported one into Ria and he started printing books and things that are still there. Um, so in 1983, a Singapore scholar, Dr. Vivian Wee, an anthropologist with her PhD from ANU, invited me to travel around the Riau Archipelago in 1983 in little boats um, and to visit royal um, members of royal families um, who still had manuscripts in their homes. So these were people who'd been involved in tin mining um, or they were just um, small traders, but they still had some manuscripts. And we filmed the manuscripts. We left the manuscripts in their homes, but we took the films back. There's now a set of the films in the library here, mm -hmm. in the Singapore University Library, and my own personal papers I have given to Monash University. So if anybody wants to know anything about Riau Linga, um, Monash University Music Archives, are where all my papers have, on Riau Linga have gone. So you're, um, I'm sure they're related to you in some way because you're very enterprising, very intelligent. <laughs> I don't know if you're good at trading and no. I, <laughs> I hope you're not good with the, with the firearms. <laughs> But I'm sure that that Boogie's initiative um, is in you. Um, and I mean, Boogie's are still traveling the archipelago and still trading. Um, but just to say that back in the 1870s, the Rio Boogie's discovered tin in Salangor mm. on the Malay Peninsula. And they started developing that with capital they had. Um, and eventually, because they're so clever, they got one of themselves made Sultan of Salangor. So the Sultanate of Salangor goes back directly to these Bugis tin miners. Mm -hmm. So that's extraordinary. So Raja Ali Haji, aware of change, um, the Dutch in Batavia were aware that um, the language of the royal family and the royal groups on Riau Linga was a very, they thought it was a very pure form of um, court Malay or high Malay. They called it Salva Malaysia. And they wanted to make dictionaries of Malay based on that language. And the person that they asked as their informant was Raja Ali Haji. So he was their source of what was correct Malay. So um, that is what um, a lot of Malay in the Malay Peninsula has been based on. And if you know about Gurindam Duabalas, yeah. um, that is the sort of language that he was supporting. But he was so clever that he realized, why should these foreigners know our pure language? I'm going to make a dictionary just for Malays. And he started compiling a dictionary, Malay Malay dictionary, for the use of Malays. And it didn't just have language words in it, it had correct, in his view, correct modes of behavior and how you should properly address a sultan, very useful. How you should address, you know, how, how you should um, care for your uh, your, yeah, yeah, yeah. your secondary wives, all this sort of thing. Um, the Dutch paid him for his work. Um, and he also asked them for candles mm -hmm. so that he could keep working at night. So he wow. copied a lot of manuscripts. So he didn't want to stop work when it was dark. Wow. He asked for a raincoat. He said, I want one of those rubber garments that keeps you dry when you're in a boat. Um, <laughs> he was really up with everything. Um, and he asked for an increase in his pay because he said, I have 62 dependents to support. So he must have had more than four wives. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a lot of children. And the interesting thing about them is the women became writers. Mm -hmm. 
So they wrote but just just on the point, but yeah, if you don't mind, uh, I, I sense that there is like a, some kind of amalgamation of two different cultures in the sense that there is a very rough culture, you know, fighting, which is more seafaring, but then there is like very soft, I mean, artistic writing, and that's very interesting. I think you're absolutely right. And I haven't thought of it like that before. I think there were individuals who did one or the other. Right. And I think because Raja Ali Haji's father, Raja Ahmad, trained him to be a writer and a scholar, that he didn't, he might have done some training, but certainly no fighting. Um, but the followers of the original uh, five brothers that came, they remained as a distinct group and they were available for jobs like being police. They were policemen and things like right. that. So I think you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I think there were different um, groups within mm -hmm. the society that did that. But what was very difficult for the Boogies right. was that the Malays that were in the Royal Court were so jealous mm -hmm. of them because they'd gone straight into high positions in the court. Um, and so they, Mamfitna <laughs> Khan, they um, made up story, they slandered them and tried to create dissension within the community so that the boogies would be expelled. Oh. But the boogies um, managed to stay. As I said, they were very clever. We probably yeah, some of our um, grandfathers and, uh, you know, um, um, Old people before us in, in, in Buginese tradition, they really value education very highly. But at the same time, they want their kids, their grandkids to have to maintain that tradition. So uh -huh. I, I remember what, because I'm the first one in my family to leave my hometown to go to Jakarta for education. And I remember one day uh, my uh -huh. mother was angry to my father because she found out my father tried to smuggle a body in my luggage. Uh -huh. Interesting. <laughs> so, so they That's support important. us to go to education, but my father himself, he wouldn't. Wanted back up. <laughs> so that, that, that seems an old tradition then. Right. Now you can see that it was done. But an, another important thing I forgot, there's so much about Raja Ali Haji. He, because I read all those manuscripts in the manuscript, the microfilms, um, I was able to identify the texts that Raja Ali Haji refers to in here. So he refers to Sajara Bukhis says this, or Sajara Darisia says right. this. And I knew what they were. And I was able to compare what Sajara Siak had, that passage, with how he'd used it. And he used it totally accurately. He mm. quoted accurately. He also uses dates. Everything has a date. And he criticizes historians who write without dates. He says that's fairy stories. Right. It should give the correct date. And that was a boogie's tradition because right. um, Professor Campbell McKnight will tell you that yeah. the boogies have diamonds. And that tradition is reflected here. Oh, yes. So I think that once a book is always a book is. <laughs> so better not smuggle a buddy in your children's <laughs> luggage. <laughs> And I understand you also, I mean, you have how many, six, seven books already and maybe more? Can you about tell us about your other 12 or 15. Okay, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I, I wanted to, I have had such a fortunate life because you heard about my undergraduate education, yes. amazing, postgraduate, amazing. And I have had mentors throughout. And um, one of them is Jamie Mackey. Um, and he, um, just get the dates right, but in 1989, he and some others in the Indonesia project organized a special um, conference to review 25 years of new order government of Indonesia. So there was a two or three, it was like an Indonesia update. So there was this overview and it was very interesting, um, but he asked, Jamie Mackey particularly asked Barbara Hatley, Professor Barbara Hatley, and me 
to run a whole one day looking at the effect of new order on the culture of Indonesia. Right. Now, for an economist, political scientist, that's pretty impressive. Anyway, we um, invited people and we had a fantastic day. It was really a great, um, wonderful contributions. And um, it was about film, about architecture, about pop music, about, um, I studied um, the uh, Pidato Nagara and of, of um, uh, Pat Harto and compared them with Sukarno speeches and made some generalizations about the new order language, Bahasabaku. So um, it was so, the papers were so good that we decided that I would edit a book. And this, this is the wonderful book that came out of that conference. It's now out of print, um, but when I went to Cornell University, so it came out in 1993, um, and it, if it could be updated, that would be fantastic, but I haven't got the energy to do it. It needs somebody else to do it. But other books will be written instead, I think. Um, it When I visited Cornell University, they said, oh, we know you, <laughs> we're using your book. So it's a book that filled a need and it continued to fill a need until 1998 when, when the new order finished. Um, so I thoroughly recommend this wonderful book. Um, as statements of where um, um, the creative life of Indonesians was um, at the high point of the new order, the late 80s and early 90s. And it includes um, Eastern Indonesia mm -hmm. as well, regional cultures there. So um, it set a benchmark, I think, for uh, studies about the interactions of society government and creative artists. Right. So I'm very proud of that. That's good. Are your books available from Amazon or? I hope so. The ones that um, are out of print are usually available as second-hand books. Right. Um, but and can, is this translated into Indonesia? Mm, not all of it, but Yudi Latif and yeah. Edi Ibrahim. Um, they somehow they got hold of a copy of my paper and they asked, they asked, they didn't pirate it. <laughs> they contacted me. That was my first contact with Yudi Latif, who became my PhD student later. Um, he asked permission to translate it into Indonesian. Mm -hmm. So my, uh, my chapter is, I'm not sure about other chapters, but the whole book, no. Okay. And... That other book. Well, this <laughs> other book. <laughs> this, Writing a new society. Yes. So this is turning back to Malaysia. And this is my magnum opus. Nearly killed me. <laughs> and um, when was this out? But the year 2000. So it's a new millennium book. And I started it in the 1990s and it got an award. Um, it's about um, how, so it's about Malay writing, creative writing um, in Malaysia from the 1920s until about the 1990s. And it shows, it tries to show how the, uh, the writers wanted to create a changed society from a feudal Malay society to a society where the Rakyat were confident enough to become leaders and not followers. So I call one chapter followers into leaders. So it's actually a lot of the writing by Malays in Malay was revolutionary mm -hmm. and some of it was sort of banned. Um, but it was actually extremely brave, very clever and satirical, funny, sexy um, and read by Malays themselves. So. I later met um, English educated Malays, Chief Justice of the High Court and so on. He said, what are you working on those crazy Malay novels for? <laughs> I said, they're really interesting. He said, I've never read any, <laughs> but other people were reading them. School teachers were reading right. them. Um, people that went on to try and make change in society were reading. So I analyzed not only the content, but 
the way that a literature, a new literature was being developed, a modern literature. Right. So this, this is a little bit incendiary too. Mm. <laughs> so this is a short history of Malaysia, um, which um, uh, Alan and Unwin, the publishers, put out a short history of most of the countries of Southeast Asia and invited me to do Malaysia. Um, and I wanted to, so you probably gathered that my interest is in people and in indigenous sources, in, in primary sources. So I wanted to try and use Malay's own views of what their history was to write about them, which I, I did. But the place I started was in the official version of history, Malay history, that was available in the uh, National Museum. Now, if you're a, an objective historian, you would be quite shocked at the version of national history in the Malaysian National Museum. So it was a lovely place to start. And similarly, the museum in Malacca um, also tells a very romanticized version of Malay history. So it was enjoyable right. <laughs> to be able to present an alternative view to the official national history um, and also to give a lot of prominence to the indigenous peoples who have been um, extremely, um, who've been overlooked and worse abused in um, some areas of Malaysia with logging, taking of their land, illegal logging and the actual treatment of those indigenous Asli, because for one reason, because they are not, many are not Muslim. Um, so I was delighted to be able to tell some of their story, um, supported by my husband, Barry Hooker, who lived with that group of people for three months in the 1960s and had also looked at their adult. So I end the book um, before I end the book while Anwar Ibrahim is in jail. Mm -hmm. um, and I end with the hope that new social media, which is very strong in Malaysia, and the new generation of young people will make a difference to the future of Malaysia. And the last big general election um, showed that that was possible. Right. Um, and so are you still following the recent development in Malaysia and Indonesia? Of course, <laughs> of course. I mean, once you start, you don't yeah. stop. Of course. And I, I can see you're very passionate with your study in Malaysia and, and Indonesia. But what do you think about the, this, the current state of studies on Malaysia and Indonesia in Australia? Um, very disappointing, extremely disappointing. Um, and I say that with some knowledge because in 1988, uh, Professor Jamie Mackey and the Asian Studies Association of Australia, um, with um, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and Department of Education, they funded a nationwide evaluation of the study of Asian studies across Australia, obviously. Um, and that was with um, Professor John Ingleson. So he and I did it. And I, my brief was to meet with school teachers mm -hmm. and examine the training of school teachers um, to look at language uh, training for all languages, not just Indonesian. Um, and to look at libraries, to look at the um, course structures um, and so on. So it was a very thorough report, which took 12 months. And so I, I learned a lot. I met translators in, and interpreters. Um, at that time, 1988, <clears throat> there was a boom in Japanese tourism to Australia. Queensland taught Japanese in schools. Um, Chinese was beginning to be taught in schools um, and Indonesian was already taught in schools and was quite strong in some schools, excuse me. So it was a flourishing time, the late 80s. Um, and it, that flowed 
into Australia, sorry, into the Australian National University. So I was helping teach first year class, um, which was very good for my teaching skills. And um, in about 1989, we had 100 students, 120 students in first year. So the um, support for all that was um, school trips to Indonesia. So um, it was possible for a lot of children to be taken with their teachers and um, go and visit schools in Indonesia and spend at least two weeks there. And they could see the language in operation, which makes all the difference. It's a living language. Um, that flowed through into universities. We got students who had done a matriculation level Indonesian, beautifully taught, especially in Victoria. Um, and so we arranged advanced Indonesian. We had to extend the university courses. So Dr. Sopomo developed these wonderful courses that I assisted with, where we would watch um, um, videos of the current news straight from Indonesia. We worked straight from Tempo, straight from any newspaper. So we used primary sources. Yeah. And we trained people from DFAT, um, we trained somebody who's currently an advisor to a very high level person. And we, we trained defense personnel. And it was, it was so good for me to have my language extended like that. And I learned that Dr. Supomo was one of the best translators from Indonesian into English I have ever met. Right. He knew the nuances to match, to find an Indonesian, uh, sorry, to find an English word to match an Indonesian word, quite brilliant. So from that came magnificent postgraduate students. Um, and from that came double degree students, especially Asian studies, Indonesian and law, so that we have alumni like Jen, Jen Robinson, who is the on the team for Julian Assange. She's currently a She's working with Jeffrey Robertson in London and in Australia for, she did practical experience in Papua. Um, she's advised on human rights across Indonesia and still does. So we had these kind of students. We have the professor of law currently at Sydney University, double degrees. So it was a magnificent time and we were all sustained and inspired by the quality of the students. So when, it, when and why did it start to decline, the support to this? Um, I left, so I retired in 2007 and it was still strong. It was still strong then. I think there was a little um, move away from Indonesian to um, maybe Chinese, mm -hmm. which is very good too, that's fine. Um, but that was um, offset by bodies like the Australia Indonesia Institute, the second track diplomacy uh, institute within DFAT, of which I was a proud board member from the um, early 2000s until 2010. And we started people to people programs and my passion is for bringing people into direct contact with each other or via zoom um, so that they can see you can see you know you're you're not an indonesian you're Acho, <laughs> and i hope i'm not an australian i'm me and we have similar interests and passions and um and hopes for indonesia and hopes for australia and we can talk about it and work out ways to do it. And one of my um, concerns is that Australians learn from Indonesia how to organise civil society, because Indonesia excels in can-do people at the local level. Right. If something needs doing, a local very small FM radio station will start up with a small radio <laughs> mast and a group will form or mini credit will be given to a group of women to get their businesses going. Um, this is what we need in Australia too. Um, 
Disaster relief training will be done. Entrepreneurship training for women is done in Indonesia through NU and Muhammadiyah. So all these things are done. So why did it fall away in Australia? Um, I have to look at government policy. The government changed and Labor, the Labor government had been, especially Paul Keating, had been particularly um, attracted to the idea of recognizing the importance of Southeast Asia in general and Indonesia in particular. And he had advisors like Professor Stephen Fitzgerald and other lobbyists who were constantly saying, this is what you can do, bringing business people to the table to say to the government, this is what you can do. And with the change of government, I'm very sorry to say under Mr. Howard, things began to fall away. So um, under Rudd, it came back a bit, but Rudd was not there long enough. Mm. So we know that Kevin Rudd is still passionately arguing for this. And in fact, is president of the Asia Society in America. <laughs> Why isn't he? I mean, I'm sure he would be here if he right. could, and he is here at the moment. Um, I think the passion is building again. Um, and I think that it does come from the schools. I'm very concerned in general about the standard of education in right. general. I have grandchildren at Australian schools. Um, I am concerned that teachers do not get the respect that they absolutely need and deserve and that their training is inadequate. Right. So they need the knowledge um, about the subject they're teaching and they need the training on how to convey that knowledge. Right. Is there anything that can be done from Indonesian side? Yes, but just at the moment. Right. And we haven't, you and I, we haven't expressed openly our concern for Indonesia and COVID at the moment, but you and I have just been talking about it. So um, the Australia Indonesia Institute has supported school to school. Right. That's the bridge program. <laughs> and um, Universities are increasingly um, setting up internships and vice versa. And of course, Julie Bishop uh, came, uh, put her support behind the new Colombo plan. Okay. So again, it's these right. practical placements, these face-to-face -face contacts, these real life situations. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, we have about 10 more minutes, uh, but I really want to talk about your other very fascinating work, and that is a book that also is directed towards children. <laughs> uh, can you tell us about it? With absolute pleasure. I'm just going to lean forward and get, get it. And it, it fits totally. Can you hold it for yes. me? Yes. Thank you. It fits totally with everything we've been talking about. Um, so originally I called it Kita Semua, but the publishers said, well, nobody will understand that, so we better call it all of us. But it's an interesting story about how it evolved, how it was born. And it was born because um, I was invited by the local schools in the little town where I live, Braidwood, to speak to children um, about Indonesian schooling and Indonesia. So I thought, what do Indonesian children learn about their own area? So I rang up the cultural attache at the Indonesian embassy. And I'd like to thank all the Indonesian ambassadors I've ever been connected with who have supported ANU's Indonesian efforts and me personally fantastic support to us. And the culture attaché said, I will send you the school textbooks for grade five and six, I think, at Sekolah Dasar Primary School in Indonesia. So he sent me the materials and I saw that not only did the children learn about Indonesian governance and administration, they learned about the governance in, in broad terms, not in detail, of each country of ASEAN. Mm -hmm. so, this is incredible. <laughs> um, so I was very impressed with that. And I showed the Australian children 
the Indonesian books and oh, wow, <laughs> they were very impressed. Um, so that that was um, that, that was one thing. And um, I mentioned this to Australia's most famous children's writer, who also lives in my region, and her name is Jackie French. It's here, Jackie French. She's famous because she her first one of her first illustrated books for children was about wombats. Hmm. Right. <laughs> so they've been translated into all kinds of language, including Indonesian. But she gets fan letters from sorry, she gets um, um, social media <laughs> messages from Korea and Germany and Finland and everywhere um, for these wombat books. So that's not all she writes. She's written a lot of things. But when I told her about my experience in the local schools, she said, we will write a book for Australian children. Oh. <laughs> okay. So um, she is a brilliant children's author. She knows the level to pitch a book to right. where it will reach that age group. So she said, do you mind if I pick your brains? You know, that means she'll just take things out of my thinking. So for a whole day, we sat together and she said, tell me about Southeast Asian history from the beginning till now. So after about six hours, I was exhausted <laughs> and she had made notes, the whole thing. And then we began to plan a book based around um, the way we talked about the history. And um, I showed her this, which is um, from Tanu, Tanu Care. Yes. It's, um, it, it's a stilt walking person and these stilts are used for racing, a racing game competition. And anybody can do it because they're just made of bamboo. Um, you don't have to order them from Amazon, <laughs> make them yourself. And that was another inspiration for me to do the book because my friend Faha Chichi um, and her husband Supo have started a, have you heard about this? Tanakea in Ledo Combo? Yeah. Yeah. So she started a special um, center for both education and play for the children of migrant workers right. in this part of East Java. And um, of course, all her Australian friends have always supported her. And I was determined that these children would be in the book. And so on the cover, the last page, so the very last page has the egg lab. So we have the children on stilts and it's not just the East Javanese Timor, the East Javanese children, it is children from Australia all through Southeast Asia can come together and do this, if they're clever, do this clever stilt walking competition. Mm -hmm. So um, we pitched the book to HarperCollins, um, which is a very, an international publisher. They were behind the concept of the book immediately. And we decided that we would present it we were, I was only given 44 pages to put the whole of the history in. We had to cut the dinosaurs out. We didn't have room for the dinosaurs. Um, so I had to divide it into 44 pages. I said there had to be maps. Um, and Jackie made little poems to match each segment of history that I divided it into. And she and the publishers said there is only one person who can illustrate this book, and it's Mr. Mark Wilson. So Mark was busy, but we waited for him, and indeed he was magnificent. So we have, um, sorry, I'd like to say that everything on the pages of this book is based in fact. So you will find Charlie Chaplin on one page to do with Vietnam, because in the 1930s, Charlie Chaplin was extremely popular in um, Vietnam. And his films with French translations, can you hold that up? His films with, so City Lights was one of the, um, <clears throat> one of the films. So he had a big influence 
on ordinary um, Vietnamese because he was for the little man. Mm -hmm. he, he was supporting the underdog. And this was immensely um, attractive in the 1930s to this colonized um, Vietnamese population. So that's why he's there. So the animals, the birds, the maps, um, the, um, the words, everything is based in fact. And there is in for East, well, for Timor, we have a picture of two children writing on a rock doing a petroglyph. Yeah. Oh, so it's beautiful. This, these are two children, and the two children go throughout the book. They are the ones that take us through the history. But their pictures on the wall of the cave actually exist. And it was the work of um, an archaeologist at ANU right. that informed me that the first known petroglyph, that's writing on a rock, um, of a human face was in these caves in Timor. Right. Into the book it goes. <laughs> wow. So um, there are notes for teachers on the website of HarperCollins that mm -hmm. go with the book. So we are hoping that um, it will be used in the classroom um, for a range of age, ages. So this was, this is just recent, um, but yeah, 2000. It came out 2019. 2019, yeah. It coincided exactly with the bushfires. Right. So it was very sad that we had a clash of a national emergency with the emergence of our right. beautiful book. Um, and since then, there's been COVID without school teaching. With, with children working at home. So we're hoping that it will um, have a second birth, a second right. coming. And the very wonderful news is that the Australia Indonesia Institute of DFAT um, has given a grant to Dr. Ellie Kent oh. to work with Gramedia to That's translate it. And it's, go, it's already translated into Indonesian and I have to check it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll be nice. checking it tomorrow. And um, hopefully it will be available in Indonesia next year. Let me show the audience about my, <laughs> my kampong. That's Makassar. Makassar is also there. <laughs> and you see, and we have gender balance. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And we have girls doing mathematics. <laughs> Amazing. So that was such a pleasure. And can I just say that yes. because um, I worked with um, with Professor Greg Feely. Oh, this is the award winning. Book. This is another yeah. award winning book. But this was a team of ANU people funded by Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, um, half a million dollars to put together a selection of primary sources right. again on Islam in Southeast Asia. So of course, Greg and I couldn't do this by ourselves. We have worked with scholars in Southeast Asia, with Muslim uh, leaders in Southeast Asia, right. with, um, with not just Indonesia, but Malaysia, uh, Philippines, um, some representatives from, of course, Southern Thailand, but Cambodia too. And we, because we work with primary sources there in the local language, we got um, honor students and graduate students to translate the documents. Mm -hmm. So we double translated them, that is two people checked them right. to make sure they're as accurate as possible. Um, but it also showcases the ANU students with the Thai documents. Um, so that's for the uprising in Southern Thailand, those are Thai documents. Um, so it was a huge team that came together to put together this right. incredible book. And there's nothing like it. It's, yeah. it's a, an incredible uh, idea and yeah. under six things. Yeah, wow. Well, so impressive, um, but yeah, um, we've reached our time limit, but let me ask you one last question. And it's very interesting to me because I remember when I came here, well, I came here in 2012, and one of the uh, seminars I attended uh, uh, around that time was the ISG, Indonesia Study Group. I remember you gave a presentation about calligraphy. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's really fascinating. So well, tell us about your, I mean, how do you get interested in calligraphy, Arabic calligraphy? 
another book. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is an Indonesian journal. Right. You can have a look. Um, so when I re so I've explained how the manuscripts I worked on were written in Arabic script, so right. I could read read Arabic script that was used to write Malay. Um, Arabic script used to write Arabic, I have a bit more trouble with, but its beauty yeah. is undeniable. Right. And it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a holy, um, meaning a, a sacred task to copy the Quran because it's the words, the revealed words of God. So it has to be done perfectly. Right. So I became interested in that aspect of Islam, where it's very personal for the calligrapher. And Ismatu Ropi, do you remember Is I know Ismatu? Ismatu, yes. So my dear husband, knowing that I was retiring in 2007, knew that I needed a project. <laughs> and he said, um, why don't you look into calligraphy? Um, find out what's happening. So we didn't have contact with anybody. So we asked Ismat, and he found but Didin Sirojuddin, okay. who is remains a, a personal, wonderful friend who uses WhatsApp to me nearly every day. <laughs> and um, he founded, um, it's an incredible story, he founded a special Pasantran, Pasantran calligraphy oh. of Quran. And um, there he teaches the traditional styles of calligraphy, the, the five styles. And um, he has, so he himself is recognized internationally as a master calligrapher. And he is um, paid to go to the Middle East to be on the panels to examine. And um, so he's a world authority. And he believes that calligraphy brings out the best in people, that it brings joy, that it brings you closer to God. And of course, during this COVID time, he's giving Zoom lessons okay. of calligraphy. <laughs> um, the Pasantran is getting stronger and stronger. Right. Um, they're attracting tourists. Um, and um, I'm just so proud of the work he does with young people because they love it. They really enjoy um, entering their works in competitions and doing their very best work to copy verses of the Quran. So when I asked them how they knew these verses, they got out their smartphones and of course they can get the Quran on their smartphone. Right. So they copy the verse yeah. <laughs> from the smartphone. But it was through Didin that I came to know about other painters that use the um, calligraphy more artistically, right. not just to copy the Quran, but to do special paintings. And so I've developed that as another special study. And next year, a book about um, contemporary Indonesian art will come out edited by um, Dr. Caroline Turner, Dr. Ellie Kent and me. Mm -hmm. um, and my chapter will be about um, contemporary Islam-inspired art, um, and the title is God is Beautiful and Loves Beauty. Wonderful. With that wonderful note, uh, we end our uh, podcast today. Uh, our guest has been uh, Professor Virginia Hooper, but Nia, thank you so much, but Nia, uh, thank you for very spending much. your time with us. And we hope that this podcast uh, can give you uh, interesting information about uh, Mbania's works and also studies on Indonesia and Malaysia. Thank you so much and see you in the next podcast. Thank you, Bacho. Thank you.